Hello and welcome to the SRCC podcast. My name is Shauna Kelly and I am one of the project workers here in the centre. Sligo Rape Crisis Centre offers support to anyone who has been affected by sexual violence. We are here to listen. We offer information, advice and a range of supports across Sligo, Leitrim and Cavan. You can contact us on 1800 750 780 or info at srcc.ie. Here with me today is Connie McGilloway, who is Advanced Nurse Practitioner and Forensic Clinical Examiner in the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit in Letterkenny. Hi, Connie. Hi, Shauna. How are you? So, Connie, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, as you said, I am the Advanced Nurse Practitioner in Letterkenny in the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit and work as a Forensic Clinical Examiner. Um, And that entails looking after anybody who is 14 years and over who presents to the Donegal Sexual Assault Treatment Unit. Um, that would entail um, looking after that person and their all their holistic needs in relation to health care. And also I would ensure that they would have the supports from psychological services like the Sligo Rape Crisis Centre or the Donegal, Sex- Donegal Sexual Abuse and Rape Crisis Centre and Angarda Síochána from a legal perspective. Can you talk a little bit about the history of SATIs in Ireland? Okay, so the history of SATU is a very interesting one from the perspective that um, the the Rotunda SATU would have been the um, first SATU in the whole of Europe. So um, whenever there were no services available, healthcare services available for anybody, and whether it's children or adults who were a victim of sexual violence. So um, initially, the Rotunda was the first. And from that, then the Donegal Sexual Assault Treatment Unit um, was developed and it commenced in 1998, covering the Northwest mostly, um, and mostly Donegal, really, rather than Sligo, Leitrim. That has come on over the years um, where the Donegal Satu has developed a lot more. So within the country, there are six Satus. But initially, it was very much just the two, one in Donegal and one in Dublin. And then Cork and Waterford developed SATU services. Um, Then based on several reports, as in the violence against women, the attrition um, into sexual violence, where people weren't going forward to the criminal justice system, um, service, you know, the, the, lots of reports that came through in relation to the Savvy report. I'm sure you've heard of that, which was in 2002, where it looked at the st- statistics in relation to people who have reported sexual violence. And that was actually quite a seminal text and has been used internationally. So what that highlighted was the number of people that had been affected by sexual violence and unwanted sexual contact. So that highlighted the fact of one in four females and one in six males. And all these studies and all these reports um, throughout the years then developed into what they called the O'Shea Report. And that O'Shea Report highlighted the gaps in services within the country. And the gaps not only in therapeutic services, but the gaps in um, health services. So that was where the six statues came. And the idea was that there would be, um, that nobody should have to travel for more than three hours to get care and holistic care in relation to services. So the statue became sort of the, um, maybe the nucleus in relation to bringing all services together. And th- from that came the national guidelines. And the first national guidelines would have been written in a collaborative way, which involved not only um, the SATU services, but also in Garda Síochána, therapeutic services, rape crisis centres, Rape Crisis Network Ireland, Forensic Science Ireland, General Practitioners, Sexual Health, all of these different agencies were brought together, which in Incorporated the HSD, the Department of Justice, TUSLA, all of these um, very uh, important services that ensure the well being of the population. And they were brought together to create um, a multi agency set of guidelines, which are the only guidelines internationally that actually show the work that is done collaboratively and a sexual assault response team effort to make sure that the person gets holistic care. And when I talk about holistic care, I'm talking about the fact that somebody can present 
to any of these services and the aim of this and the mission is that somebody presents and they are treated in a non-judgmental, in a very sensitive way, in a way that they feel that they are going to be looked after by the best possible people very specialized people in a very high standard of care. Um, so that has been happening. And every four years, these guidelines are updated. They're updated with legislation. They're used, um, the, this group, the uh, guidelines group are advocates for making sure that sexual violence is on the agenda on every level and making sure that um, there are funding resources available to services to make sure that people are looked after, whether from a healthcare perspective, a legal perspective, or a, a therapeutic perspective. And the latest guidelines are coming out now this year, which looks at all of these things and has updated all aspects of it. Now, in relation to the care that is provided within SATU services, so there was always traditionally the most important thing was that anybody that reports sexual violence, anybody that reports um, a sexual assault or a rape, um, that it is a criminal offence. It's extremely serious offence. And with that, um, it needs to be recognised in such a way. So traditionally, the um, when somebody presented to a SATU service, then it was with Angarda Shiakana. So Angarda Shiakana would have brought them to the service. They would have had a forensic medical examination, which was a head to toe examination, and the provision of comprehensive health care, medication to prevent pregnancy, medication to prevent sexually transmitted infections, medication to prevent um, HIV, medication to look after any pain, minor injuries would have been treated, all of these aspects of care. Also, therapeutic services would be available at that time as well. So that was the traditional way, which was one option. And then it was highlighted that not everybody wants to report this to the Gardaí. And therefore, people who don't want to report it should also be given exactly the same level of care. Um, so that's where somebody is at currently 18 years and over and has the capacity to make decisions for themselves. So they will come forward. If they don't want to report it to the guards, that is their choice. And of course, because of the level of crime that this uh, involves, we would always encourage the reporting of the crime. But it is done at the person's pace. It is done at how they are ready and when they're ready to report. Bearing in mind that anybody can present to a SATU service at any time. It doesn't have to be within the a certain period of time. It can be at any time. So, and also anybody can report to Angarda Sheikhana at any time. There's no, what they call statute of limitations on reporting this crime. So it has to be done when it suits that person. It has to be done at their pace when they're ready to move forward. If they want to move forward. And the most important thing for us is their healthcare needs and their therapeutic needs and making sure that they are able to move forward in themselves and um, get on with their lives, really. So in 2016, there was a third option that was brought in, and this was based on international best practice. And that option was where somebody could have the full forensic medical examination without Ngarda Shiakana and that we would be able to freeze that evidence and freeze toxicology and freeze any of the samples that were taken during a forensic examination. So those are three options of care that are available within SATU. And that allows somebody the time to think about what they want to do. It allows them time up to a year to be able to say, okay, well, maybe I'm ready with the therapeutic support that they're actually able to report on to the Garda and then the guards will um, take the samples with the person's consent. So people can have their samples frozen for quite a long time, up to a year, and if they want, even up to two years. And what, what we find is about 30% of our patients then do go on to report to Angarda Shiakana, um, and normally it's within a six-month period. So with the support that they get from the rape crisis centers and with the support that they get from SATU services, they are able to actually um, feel that they are ready to move forward and report. But there's no pressure. It's up to that person, um, really. And again, that option is for somebody who is 18 years and over. 
Um, the other aspect of it is is the importance of working together as a team in relation to working with our colleagues within Rape Crisis Centre, working with our colleagues within Angarda Siakana and our colleagues within the health services, whether it's mental health services, addiction services, so that we can actually refer people to the necessary services that they need. And that also includes domestic violence services because a lot of our patients would present to us who um, suffer domestic violence, who are um, where sexual violence is very much a part of the domestic violence within the home. And um, many people don't actually recognize that until they present to counseling. So it is something that um, has been highlighted more and more within domestic violence services that sexual violence is, is sexual violence is key within that abuse. So it's something that we're very familiar with as well. So what can a person expect when they come to SASHI? So depending on how they are referred. Okay, so if they have gone to Angarda Siakana and reported to Angarda Siakana, a lot of the time they may um, travel with Angarda Siakana to the SASHI service. They don't have to. They could travel with a friend. They could travel with a family member. That's their choice. Um, when they come into SASHI, then we will already be there. We will have the unit nice and comfortable and warm. The kettle is always on. And the, um, when somebody presents, then we they're greeted with um, either myself or another forensic examiner. Um, a SATU support staff member who is either a nurse, a midwife or a healthcare assistant. And that person, the SATU support staff, is there to support that person through the whole journey of their time within SATU services. It allows the forensic examiner to get on with the um, examination and the support staff then look after the um, advocacy role and also the healthcare, you know, vital OBS, things like that, making sure that the person is comfortable to move forward in different things. So it's very much that the nurse or healthcare assistant is there making sure that their healthcare needs are being met from minor injuries, maybe medication being given, that sort of thing. And then there is also a member, a volunteer psychological support worker from Rape Crisis Centre. Um, and sometimes there's actually, if the person is domestic violence, there may be somebody um, from the domestic violence service there rather than somebody from Rape Crisis Centre there, depending on the needs of the person. So everything is based on what that person coming through the door needs. And when they come through, we want to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Lots of people come in, they're extremely nervous. They don't know what they're coming into. Our unit in the Northwest is extremely bright. It's lovely colors. There's lovely paintings on the walls. It's an area that is a safe space. It's um, the, when somebody comes in, they're the only person. They are the focus of our care for that time that episode that they present they and it normally takes between up to three hours that they will spend within the SATU service um, and all their cares is met at that time so whenever they do come in um, they will meet with the rape crisis center and the rape crisis will explain to them about the psychological support that they will um, be offered afterwards while they're there and also afterwards also if the person presents with a family member the rape crisis center person or a, or a friend um the the rape crisis person will then sit with that friend while the um person who has experienced the sexual violence comes to have the examination now i suppose sometimes especially if it's a young person they don't want a parent with them when they're having the examination. They don't want a parent with them when they're talking about what happened. They are happy to do that themselves. And sometimes they do want that person and that's okay. Um, we have already prepared the premises so that it is decontaminated so that we are in a position where there's no contamination going to happen from one case to another. Um, and then, so we chat about the history, we look at past medical history, we look at any allergies, we look at things like that so that um, we can make sure that we're given whatever medication that is necessary, depending on what the person says, and also that it doesn't counteract with anything else that they may be on. Um, then we talk about, a, we take a very brief history of what happened, and that's really to guide us on taking forensic samples. So, and that is done 
quite quickly, depending on how the person, um, it's done at their pace, really. Now, in the meantime, if somebody smokes or, you know, needs to have a break at any time that person can take a break. So they could go out and have a cigarette. They could go out and get a breath of fresh air. So it's not all, it has to be done in a way that is very much at that person's pace. Some people want to come in, they want to have it done as quickly as they can. Some people just need that bit more space to be able to think about what they want to do, to be able to think about what they want to say. Nothing is done to anybody unless they give complete consent. And it is explained the whole way through. And also consent is fluid. What what I mean by that is that if somebody says that, yes, I'm happy to do this, and then they've changed their mind, then that is, you know, anybody can opt out of anything at any time. They can stop the examination at any time. We're not going to force somebody to, into doing something that they don't. That's already happened. And we don't want to, we want to allow that person to take control of the situation themselves again. So we give a lot of space for that. So when we do the examination, it's very much um, based on where the person says that they have been harmed, where that person has hurt them. We would say for anybody that is coming to SATU, you know, we would ask them, you know, we would, if they have showered, that's okay. But we would prefer, of course, that they haven't showered. We would prefer that the clothing that they were wearing at the time that they haven't washed it, that they haven't um, thrown it out, that they haven't got rid of it, because it's very good evidence in cases like this. Um, and then whenever we, so if there's any minor injuries, we will treat them. And we also have a lovely shower area so that people can actually have a nice shower and, you know, nice, um, you know, perfume sort of stuff so that they can actually feel a bit more human again whenever they're leaving us. And also say if the person has come to us directly from an incident where maybe they haven't had a change of clothing, we provide a change of clothing as well. So, you know, everybody leaves our unit feeling a lot better. And this would be from patient feedback. They do feel a lot better when they've had the examination and when they leave because they feel like they have been listened to. They feel like they have been believed. They feel that they have been told this is not your fault. This is, you know, this person has harmed you. You have done nothing wrong here. And that we constantly are allowing them the space to actually feel that human again and be able to take control of the situation that um, has been, I suppose, put on them without their control. Um, and when they leave, then we will contact them or they will have they will have contact from Rape Crisis Centre, whether it is the Donegal Rape Crisis Centre or the Sligo Rape Crisis Centre, whatever, whoever, and depending on where they live, um, whoever would be the closest. And then we will follow them up as well. So they'll so the SATU is like a one stop shop from the perspective that you don't have to go elsewhere then to get health care. So the person will come back to us for follow up care. We have outreach in Sligo, we have outreach in Donegal Town, and we have the unit in Letterkenny. So the person comes back, has their full sexual health screen and any continuation of medication that we would have provided. We also do opportunistic cervical screening because what we find is that somebody may be who has a history of sexual violence has never actually taken on cervical screening. So we provide that service as well. And a lot of our patients actually take that service on from us. So um, it is very much looking at the holistic model of care and very much from a trauma informed perspective. So we are very familiar with the sensitivity uh, of this type of um, harm that has been caused. It is extremely traumatic for anybody to have gone through um, any form of sexual violence. And we recognize that and we recognize it from the perspective of how we care for that person. So there is no judgment there. It's very much we treat everybody coming through our door in a very sensitive manner. And we hope that is reflected in our care. Hello, you are listening to the SRCC podcast, which is coming to you today from our head office on Kempton Parade in Sligo Town, just beside the Garavogue River. Today we're chatting with Connie McGilloway, who is Advanced Nurse Practitioner and Forensic Clinical Examiner in the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit in Letterkenny. 
What are some challenges that you face within your role in SATI? Well, I suppose like anything, you know, when you're working with lots of different agencies, um, although it is a privilege to work with lots of different agencies, sometimes we find that maybe we're not all on the same page. And so it's that in itself can be a challenge to bring everybody together for the benefit of the person that we're all caring for. And that is the patient that walks through our door. Um, We all call the patient a different name. So rape crisis centers would call the person who has experienced this um, a client. Um, We call everybody that walks through our door a patient. The guardee call um, somebody that has experienced this type of crime as the injured party. So we all have a different name, but the actual focus is exactly the same as providing that holistic care, that medical, legal, therapeutic care that everybody should be um, focused on. And with that, um, the challenges are where making sure that people are doing the right thing at the highest possible standard for that person. So I'm involved in a lot of training I do a lot of training with Angarda Siakana. I do a lot of training with um, therapeutic services, um, addiction services, right across the board, um, different professionals, GPs, you know, to make sure that it is out there that people need to be treated in a certain manner um, whenever they present. And the questions to ask if somebody does present and not to be afraid to ask the right question. Um, Of course, the other challenges are resources, and that's a challenge that every organization has, and making sure that we have the right resources for the person and they're getting the highest standard of care. Um, But like that, you know, I think um, challenges are a good way of um, reaching your goals. So we try to, um, well, endeavor to meet every challenge head on so that um, the person that's walking through the door is looked after. So I know you've mentioned that SATU care is for anyone on over the age of 14. Is there care available for people under 14? Yeah, so um, SATU services are available for 14 years and over. So it's somebody who is post-pubertal. That is where it was looked at from a SATU perspective. Um, However, within Ireland, um, children's services are really only being developed now Um, in the Gal in Galway. um, They have had a child service, the CASATS, it's called Child and Adolescent Services, Sexual Assault Services, and that has now come under the Barna House model. And the Barna House model is an Icelandic model that has come into Ireland. um, And the idea of it is that it's all care, so therapeutic care and medical services and legal services all within the one house. So um, that is a a model that has been developed in Galway, um, Cork and Dublin. And anybody from the Northwest would would have to travel to Galway um, if they are under the age of 14. Um, And that is where the specialised services are at the moment. We ask everyone who comes on the podcast to have a chat with us this question. Um, So what do you do for self-care? Well, I um, I play music. That is my go-to pastime. I love music. I've always loved music. I am a singer and I'm a guitarist. I used to play keyboards all the time, but um, I've developed now into guitar and singing. I don't know how good I am, but I do it anyway, whether people want to listen or not. Um, and I'm also a mad gardener. My house is a tip, but my garden is an absolute palace. So the other thing in relation to work wise, I mean, that is definitely, you know, where I live. I'm very fortunate. I live in Donegal. I live beside a beach. And so the beach is also my go to place to clear my head. But um, I would also attend clinical supervision. So it's very important to be able to do that because um, what we find is, we talked about earlier the challenges. The challenges are not the patients that come through our door. The challenges are the system. The challenges are, you know, recognizing the fact that um, we're all battling against a system where people feel that, you know, they're not believed. And you want to make sure that 
that is not the case. You want to make sure that people are heard and that um, services are available. So you're fighting against the system. So clinical supervision for me is always about the system. It's rarely about the patient because the patient is always a privilege to to, um, look after whenever they come through the Satu service. So that would be my main self-care. Thank you for that. And is there anything else you would like to say to survivors of sexual violence or anything else you'd like to add? Well, I suppose it's recognising the fact that there are services available, that um, it is a case of going on, you know, most people have access to the internet nowadays. Um, Really all somebody has to do is put an SATU into into Google and sexual assault treatment services will come up as the first um, item on Google search. And within that site that you will find out all there is to know about SATU services and where SATU services are available to you. What we have noticed in the last couple of years is the amount of people who have actually self-referred um, and that is okay. We, you know, we are, we welcome anybody who, um, you don't have to go to a, a GP, you don't have to go to a Garda station, you don't have to go through another professional, you can pick up the phone yourself and actually refer into SATU services. And that's really important that people understand that, that they don't have to talk to anybody else, that they can talk to us personally. So um, that would be one thing that I would say to people. Also, if something has happened to you or a friend or even thinks that something has happened to you or a friend, that just pick up the phone and ask the question and that we are able to actually, um, we are specialized in this area and able to answer your questions and put your mind at ease or arrange for you to come in and be seen. You're not going to be forced to do anything, but we will advise you on the phone and what to, what to do and what not to do and what to bring with you. So that would be, just pick up the phone. That's what I would say. That's great. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Connie. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the SRCC podcast. If you would like more information, some support, or if you would like to make an appointment, please get in touch with us on 1-800-750-780 or info at srcc.ie. We're here to listen.